I was glad to hear from you. Believe it or not, pal, I just received your letter today. It must have followed me all over the world. But it got to my wife, and she wrote it open and read it and sent it to me this morning. Well, I came back to East and run into a shotgun wedding, and I was a ghost. Harry Parch was a composer who lived from 1901 to 1974. Um, to some of us who, uh, who love his music, he is one of the most important composers of the 20th century. Um, and in some ways for opening up new uh, possibilities is the most important. invented his own uh, orchestra of instruments to play microtonal music. The, the, to give an idea, the fixed pitch instruments have 43 tones per octave, but that, it, the unfixed pitch instruments are in no way limited to 43 tones and play much more. And also the, the, uh, the tuning is in just intonation as opposed to equal temperament that's common to Western fixed pitched instruments. Now, I think my music is intrinsically corporeal. That It has a body feeling about it. I care what the instruments look like. They are pieces in space. They are spatial products. And being in space, they have to look great. They have to be inspiring all by themselves. Then the man who, the man or woman who plays that instrument is a part of the instrument. It's a oneness. It's a wholeness, and uh, by God, if I have anything to say about it, he's not going to look like a, uh, an amateur California prune picker. Some of them are, are instruments where I think that you, one could say that they're really planned out in terms of he had an idea for an instrument and then had to obtain the materials to realize the goal. And some of them um, range more in the found object type of instrument where he had some objects that made interesting sounds and assembled them into an instrument. Um, most of them are built in a way where, where they're beautiful to look at and, and that's part of the, the theory theatrical element of his music theater, which is to have these beautiful instruments on stage to be seen and, and to be integrated into the music and the action of each piece. This tongue must vibrate at virtually the same frequency as this cavity. And so you can say, you can say, the tongue must couple with the cavity or there's no resonant tone. And, uh, yes, this is very sexy. Other composers in this century have invented new instruments, and they've looked outside the culture to examine the rituals of non-Western man. Harry's done this also, but he's also brought a, a tuning system that gives a complete tonal gamut of, of dissonance and consonance. To this, he's built a whole new orchestra of instruments in a multimedia presentation. first one, I think it was 1919, it was a new organization, and uh, I recall this great body of blue-haired ladies sitting below me, 
And 45 years later, mind you, I went to another concert in the same city, and behold, the sea of blue. Now, there's nothing wrong with blue-haired red ladies, of course. But if we aren't concerned about our youth, we're headed straight to a dead end. Two, three, four. I'd like to do it again. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one. I'm old enough to have been a, a young man and, and performed in the 1969 version of Delusion of the Fury, and then I also was music director in New Band's version in 2007. I met him when I was 16 and he was 65, and he didn't have many more instruments that he was building at that point, just finishing up a couple for uh, the, end of, the end of the Petals of Petaluma project and, and also Delusion of the Fury, and, and so I, I saw a bit of that. Yes. Watch that bar. You can't play around with it. Up and down, up and down. I mean, you can't tilt it constantly. Oh, okay. you, It's got to be at a constant angle. That's better. There you go. Good. Well, Delusion of the Fury is Harry Parch's last big work. He, he had composed several other uh, stage works, and, and this is the final one. And um, it, it's definitely probably the most, the, the, the highest level music of any of the stage works. Uh, it, it, some of the others are just as strong theatrically and to my way of thinking, but, but this is sort of the culmination of a lifetime of his musical work. The, the piece is based on two folk stories. One of them is a, is a Japanese uh, um, uh, folk tale and the other one is an African folk tale. And the first one is, is serious and the second one is comic. because that's exactly what I did. When I was pretty young, I've been going outside ever since. I went outside in the big ranch country of Arizona and almost got bitten by a rattlesnake and uh, a thousand other things. And then later I went outside of music. I guess I'm still going outside, but I'm not a little boy any longer. I would choose to be anonymous, of course. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the fantastic cave drawings in, in France and southern France and in northern Spain, La Altamira, I think it is. And there's no author there. What a treasure they are. And, and uh, who, who cares who wrote them? How many thousand years, years ago was that? No, well, of course, I'm not saying that anything I'm going to do is going to last that long. But who cares what the name was? property, dark, red, and very fragrant, that are perfect for rose petal jam. I was told about this by a, an old friend who was born on a Greek island. It is a Greek delicacy. And the recipe is about as simple as anything can be. A few rose petals of the right kind, a little water. 
a little sugar. Stir and boil for about one minute. Ah, Rose Petal Jam.